Our passage this week is found in the book of Exodus, chapter 25, verses 1 through 9. So you can follow along on the screen or in your Bibles. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Tell the sons of Israel to take a contribution for me. From everyone whose heart moves him, you shall take my contribution. This is the contribution which you are to take from them, gold, silver, and bronze, violet, purple, and scarlet material, fine linen, goat hair, ram's skins dyed red, fine leather, acacia wood, oil for lighting, balsam oil for anointing oil and for the fragrant incense, onyx stones and setting stones for the ephod and for the breastpiece. Have them construct a sanctuary for me, so that I may dwell among them. According to all that I am, going to show you as the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furniture, so you shall construct it. Recall that last Sunday, we witnessed God's great rescue plan, playing out through the story of the Exodus. However, we also saw that in spite of God's power in provision, the people kept grumbling about what they didn't have. They didn't realize it, but they were about to be wandering through the desert for 40 years. Long enough that the entire generation that was rescued from Egypt, except for two men, would die before God would allow them to enter the Promised Land. They were a people without a home. They had no permanent place to lay down roots, nor to worship God. They were nomads. Now, a little over a month ago, we celebrated Christmas. Now, at Christmas time, we often give gifts to one another. Now, imagine for a minute that you have received a gift. You spend time admiring the immaculate wrapping job. By the way, that gift would not have come from me if their job was that immaculate. But the beautiful bow, and the, even how neatly they wrote your name on the package. In fact, you admire it so much that you never open the present to see the real gift inside. We acknowledge a gift, but we miss out on the real gift. One can't help but focus on the specificity of God's plans for the tabernacle and all the beauty and money that was poured into it. It really was a tremendous gift from God to give the Israelites a place for them to worship God. However, if we keep our eyes solely fixed on the physical elements of the tabernacle, we miss an opportunity to understand the ultimate message that God was conveying. We miss unwrapping the greater gift. My sermon in a sentence this week is this. The tabernacle and each of its elements was a word picture intended to reveal God's redemptive plan through Jesus Christ. Now let's focus first on the immediate purpose. So the immediate purpose of the tabernacle was for a location for God to dwell among his people. We read that in verse 8 of, at the beginning. Have the people of Israel build me a holy sanctuary so that I can live among them. You see, because the Israelites were nomadic people... <clears throat> The, the tabernacle was specifically designed to be mobile. The tabernacle would be where God's presence would dwell with his people, within the Holy of Holies. And it would also be the place in which the people would offer their sacrifices and worship. Now, the building of the tabernacle, you can see a kind of a 2D uh, layout there. Uh, was incredibly important within the context in the Exodus alone, in Exodus alone. It showed that God in his kindness would still come down and meet them where they were in spite of their sin. 
Remember last week all that they had done in response to God's blessings. Go back all the way to Genesis chapter 2. We read that God came down to Adam and Eve and walked with them in the garden. And we see it is here that God comes down to be in relationship with his people. The tabernacle also gave Israel a context by which God could deal with their perpetual sin. Later in history, as you probably well know, once they settle in the promised land, the tabernacle is replaced with the temple. Now, the tabernacle, as you read, I'm sure, this past week, was adorned with much bronze and gold, and was indeed built to very specific directions. Hopefully, what you were able to pick up in the video was that when you entered into the outer court, you would first see the altar of burnt offering. There, the common people were required to bring spotless and unblemished animals to the altar of burnt offering to a priest who would sacrifice in repentance for their sins. This had to be done twice a day, every day. It's impossible to imagine the constant stench and the quantity of blood. The sacrifice was made as an atonement for a personal or communal sin. Now, after the priest sacrificed the animal, he would walk over to the laver, which held water. The laver of bronze was a wash basin used by the priests to wash off their hands and their feet, to be cleansed. Take note here, something that you maybe miss, is that the objects in the outer court, so we're talking about these two, the labor and the altar, those were, uh, in, they were covered with bronze. And again, they were built with very specific directions. The bronze there is used to signify, it symbolizes the, the nature of man, that is the sin of man. At this point, the common Israelite could go no further. The only people who could enter into the holy place were the priests. Everything in the holy place and the holy of holies was designed or covered with gold that symbolizes deity. Inside the holy place, there were three elements. The lampstand, the table of showbread, and the incense altar. As there were no windows, the olive oil that burned in the lamps was the only light. It served as a light in a dark place. On the table of showbread, there were 12 loaves of bread representing the 12 tribes of Israel. The loaves of bread were considered holy, an offering before the presence of God, and could be eaten only by the priests. Each week on the Sabbath, the priests consumed the old bread and replaced it with fresh loaves and frankincense supplied by the people. Finally, the priests would refill a special mixture of incense on the golden altar in the morning and evening. So a sweet-smelling smoke issued from it day and night and lit it. Although this altar was in the holy place, its fragrant odor would rise above the veil and would fill the inner holy of holies, where the Ark of the Covenant sat. When the breeze would be right, it might carry the smell outside into the courtyard, among the people offering sacrifices. When they smelled the smoke, it reminded them that their prayers were constantly being carried to God. Beyond the altar of incense was a veil that blocked the priests from the Holy of Holies. Now, the Holy of Holies was the innermost chamber, a room that so sacred only one person, the high priest, could enter it in only one day a year. This room was a perfect cube, 15 feet in each direction. <clears throat> Only one object was housed there, the Ark of the Covenant. There was no light inside other than the glow from God's glory. 
Thus the high priest served as the intermediary for all the people in the presence of God. This responsibility was done in a manner that matched the seriousness of such a responsibility. Now, as we consider the physical tabernacle, perhaps we begin to understand the purpose it served primarily for the Israelites. It gave God a place to dwell among them while also providing a place for reconciliation to be made for their sins. It was a tremendous gift to the Israelites. But if we see the tabernacle story only in its physical location, it's like the Christmas present I referenced earlier. You admire the beauty in what you see, but you miss out on the real gift, the real purpose of the tabernacle. Secondly, the ultimate purpose for the tabernacle was that it revealed a greater spiritual meaning for the church age that was to come. Now check out what John said in his prologue of the Gospel of John. He wrote, The Word became flesh and took up residence among us. We observed His glory the glory as the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. The Gospel of John, like pretty much all of the rest of the New Testament, was written in Greek. And the phrase John used actually there says, took up residence. That phrase means to pitch a tent, to encamp, to tabernacle. To dwell in a tent. So a more literal translation of John's words there might be this. The word became flesh and tabernacled among us. The Old Testament tabernacle was a sign of Jesus who was to come. Paul also, Paul also speaks to this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, we read, our bodies are like tents that we live here on earth. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. For do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? And one more, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? Paul is very clearly saying in the church age, the tabernacle represented the believer in the church age. Excuse me. He's saying in the church age, the tabernacle represents the believer. With God dwelling in our innermost parts, our soul and our spirit. You see, God didn't intend for his people to dwell, draw close to him through a tent. He intended for people to draw close to him through Jesus. God didn't intend the people to receive forgiveness through a tent or through sacrifice. He intended for sin to be forgiven through Jesus. God didn't intend people to worship him through a tent. He intended for people to worship him through Jesus. Thus, the primary purpose of the tabernacle story is not about the building, but about our bodies, about us. It is vital to understand that what God says is greater worth than gold and silver. And that is our soul and our spirit. Now, the physical altar provided a place for the Israelites to offer sacrifice, which I've already stated. That was a great gift. Yet the greater spiritual truth is found in 1 Peter 1, verses 18 and 19. Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with the precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless. The blood 
of Christ. Not only that, his death covers all of our sins. Jesus paid for them all at the cross. The labor was an element for cleansing the priest's hands and feet. However, the greater spiritual truth here is in referring to the cleansing waters of baptism. Throughout the Bible, water represents cleansing. John the Baptist baptized with water in a, in a baptism of repentance. Believers today continue to enter the waters of baptism to identify with Jesus in his life, death, burial, and resurrection. And as a symbol of the inner cleansing and the newness of life wrought by the blood of Jesus at Calvary. The washing of the labor of bronze foreshadowed the New Testament act of baptism and speaks of new birth and new life, which we refer to as sanctification. To the woman at the well, Jesus revealed himself as the source of life. He said, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Consider Peter's words in 1 Peter chapter 2. He wrote, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Revelations chapter 5, verse 10. You have made those you have purchased through your blood into a kingdom and priests to your God. In light of this, Jesus is declaring us to be priests so that we are able to enter the holy place instead of needing someone, some other human, to represent us. The first veil was torn away as we enter into the holy place. Now, when we walk in there, we remember that we see one of the first things you probably would witness was the lampstand because of the light. It was a light in a dark place. Remember that Jesus told the people, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus goes even further. He says this about his followers. He says, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and give its light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Revelation chapter 2, verse 5. We understand that the lampstand refers to the church. Brothers and sisters, we are to be a light in a dark world. Now, in our current context here in the U.S., the darkness is becoming more blatant and prominent. Darkness always attempts to snuff out light because it's the only way that it can fight. The light's response is to fight with the truth of God's word. Paul tells us that the sword of the armor of God that we are to put on is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. When you listen to other people, or even maybe to the things you say. Do you discern truth by what sounds right or by the word of God? The table of showbread was a constant reminder of God's everlasting covenant with his people and his provision to the 12 tribes of Israel. In John chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never again be thirsty. 
Fast forward 16 verses and we read him again saying, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. The altar of incense reminded Israel that prayer was to play a central role in the lives of God's people. Remember, the sweet-smelling smoke from incense represented the people's prayers ascending to God. They were told that this was to be burned continuously. It was to never go out. In light of that, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, we are to pray without ceasing. Today, Christians are assured that their prayers are pleasing to God because they are offered by the great high priest, Jesus. Just as the incense carried a perfumed odor, our prayers are, sense, are scented with the righteousness of our Savior. In Revelation chapter 8, verses 3 and 4, John tells us the prayers of the saints ascend to the altar of heaven before the throne of God as smoke of incense. At this point, we run into a second veil. Remember that only the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies one day a year. Recall also that when Jesus died in Matthew 27, we read, At that moment when he died, the curtain of the temple was torn from top to bottom into two pieces. We observe that the veil was torn physically, but the deeper meaning is that he is the high priest who will freely go to God on our behalf. Hebrews chapter 4. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firm to the faith that we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. The high priest was to be a Levite. Yet Jesus was from the line of Judah. So how can this be? Remember that Melchizedek was a high priest that we read about in Genesis. In Genesis 14, we learn that he was a king of Salem and a priest of God the Most High. He was considered a priest, a high priest, despite the fact that he was not a Levite. With that in mind, Psalm 110 verse 4 says about Jesus, You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. In Hebrews chapter 7 verses 24 through 27, because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for us. Such a high priest truly meets our need, one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. No, he sacrificed for his sins once for all when he offered himself. There is no sacrifice we can make. Hear this. There is nothing we can do to satisfy what is needed to live in God's presence forever. However, the sacrifice that can satisfy was pro provided for us freely through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus that we receive through repentant faith. So, with all that said, there's a lot of information, a ton of verses. 
Now, hopefully they're on, I think hopefully I got them all listed down there on your sheet so you can go back through and dig into this again later. But so, so with all that said, what does all this tabernacle talk really mean to you? It's a revealing of the reality that we are to focus on how we are to be adorned. It isn't about the building, it's about us. Now, let's be careful here because uh, we got to make sure that what we're adorning is what God really intended. So, before we, we focus on something else, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, which says, Do not let your adorning be external. The braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear. Catch that? It isn't about what you wear. It's not about the building. It's not about what you wear. Please come appropriately dressed, okay? <laughs> but having said, it isn't about that. <clears throat> we could say, well, what do we do now? But he finishes it here. But let your adorning. Be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. I'm going to read 1 Corinthians again one more time, verses 19 and 20, chapter 6. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you are bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. God's work, okay, I didn't make the most important part this morning. God's work of beautifying the temple or the tabernacle is about revealing to us his desire to work on our inner being. To teach us how to live with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness and self-control. God has pitched a tent through each of us. And I pray that he is dwelling in your life at this moment. But if not, know that he longs to pitch a tent in your, in your innermost parts, in your spirit, in your soul. We are not promised tomorrow. Is today the day that you allow Christ into your life? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I, I want to just thank you for, uh, for your word. That you put things in there so that we recognize that it is uh, it is always pertinent to us regardless of the age in which we live the, the nation with which we reside none of that matters Lord what matters is your word help us to focus as a body uh, that what you long for is uh, inner beauty in us with that in mind, that we are all in this together. We, Lord, in a few weeks ago, we talked about the fact that we recognize that we all make mistakes and that it is time that in acknowledgement of that, that we can live, uh, we can live in uh, truth and love and grace with one another. <laughs> that we don't have to live uh, as though we're walking on eggshells, worried about what uh, skeletons there may be in our closet. Lord, we know that uh, you know them. You've asked us to repent of them and return to you. Lord, we want to give them to you and, and rid them from our lives so that we can serve you together. So, Lord, with that in mind, I just pray for uh, a fresh uh, level of your spirit in us, being willing to challenge and encourage and and uh, have conversation with one another towards the end of continuing to build each other up. Help us to become more loving and more peaceful and, and, and patient in all of those things with which you've commanded us. Keep our focus on that which you have told us ultimately matters to you. 
Yet, Lord, we are also thankful for this place where we can gather as a corporate body. We are so blessed to have this, uh, this location where we can come together. But, Lord, as we prepare to end our huddle this Sunday, help us to be emboldened and encouraged and strengthened to go and, and fight the battle which faces us uh, this course of this week. We pray that you will uh, use us to, to bring Christ into our community, into Meeker County, and uh, to extend our reach uh, as far as, as you can use us. In your name we pray. Amen. Please stand for the benediction and the closing song. <clears throat> Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, be immovable. Always excelling in the work of the Lord. Because you know that the Lord, that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Remember, church, each of us here is sent. <laughs>